During my PhD, I knew a researcher that would storm down the hallways. He'd walk extremely fast, as fast as he could, to get from one end to the other. You'd hear him studying closer immediately after he left his lab all the way down the hall. I'm a big proponent of exercise, so it didn't really strike me as curious, but this wasn't exactly exercise. And it turns out what might have seemed peculiar to some is probably something that we should all be doing, especially once you hear the data on what kind of an effect it has on preventing death of all causes. We're gonna be covering VILPAs. I'll explain what that is, what impact that they have on your mortality risk, how much to do and how to do them properly. Let's get into the science. We're talking about intermittent physical activity. No, not exercise. In fact, I like uh, Dr. Brad Stanfield's definition, exercise snacks is what he calls it. It's a pretty apt name, but maybe even too uh, exercise-y because we're not talking about doing any explicit exercise, just a slight shift in our day-to-day -day activities. We'll get into uh, some of the examples later. In a massive analysis, researchers tracked data from 25,000 individuals, fitness trackers, over seven years and tried to understand what impact vigorous, intermittent lifestyle physical activity, or VILPAs, had on all-cause mortality, as well as two major contributors to death, cardiovascular disease and cancer. They compared those that engaged in one or more VILPAs compared to those that engaged in none. Here we have that data on all-cause mortality. The vertical axis is the hazard ratio or the amount of reduced risk compared to not engaging in VILPA. The horizontal is the amount of VILPA bouts or moments a person engages in, with more going rightward. The histogram there simply indicates the number of participants in each category. Now, as you can see, the line for all-cause mortality immediately drops, indicating a reduced risk of mortality from simply engaging in one one-minute VILPA, and the relationship indicates further benefit of doing more bouts, but a large chunk of the relationship occurs from just doing one. Look at that, a video title that actually delivers. But we're not done because we have to get into some of the specifics. For one, if we pop open the cardiovascular disease mortality data and the cancer data, we can see it's roughly the same. So we know that at least part of the all-cause mortality reduction is likely through a reduced cardiovascular mortality and cancer mortality. But as an astute observer will note, these are associations, but fortunately the researchers did do a series of statistical adjustments to control for different factors. Here they are. A lot of obvious possible confounding factors, variables that could explain this reduction in risk and need to be accounted for to establish a more secure relationship between VILPA and reduced mortality. But I will note that they don't control for everything. For example, note that they don't control for things like blood cholesterol, blood pressure, blood sugar, and so on. Why not? This is actually a great thing. They're avoiding something called a mediator bias. These factors, blood pressure, blood sugar, and so on, are mediators, meaning that they contribute to disease like high blood sugar and diabetes. However, VILPA's mechanism of action may work through these mediators. So if you remove them from the analysis, you're flattening the effect and have a good chance of missing a relationship that would otherwise be there. It's a lot like, uh, I don't know, lifting weights and removing muscle gain as a factor when measuring strength. Since muscle directly contributes to strength, even if not exclusively, it might eliminate the relationship between lifting weights and strength. So, like I said, it's a good thing that they didn't over adjust here. They also had some timing mismatch uh, between the uh, blood sugar, cholesterol, and blood pressure data and the data that they used to determine VILPA. Another good reason not to add these adjustments. Speaking to that, what are examples of VILPA that you can implement in your own life? And can we get more objective measures if we are engaging in VILPA? We'll address those two questions next, or next after this quick point. There's more on the optimal amounts of VILPA, maximum amounts where doing more won't do much more for you, and the answers to questions like, does this apply if I exercise regularly? Or, uh, I'm a generally healthy person, do things change for me? Anyway, 
I'm covering uh, more in an in-depth analysis of all that in my extended version of this video. If you're interested in having all the details and specialized takeaways, check out the Physionic Insiders, my premium research review, which also includes a private podcast, live sessions with me, an active community, written research reviews with short summaries and more. The link to join is in the uh, description. If you want an honest appraisal of research and how to apply it to your life, it's the place to be. I'd really love to have you there. So what are examples of VILPA? Let's start general and then let's define it more specifically. Like I said, this isn't structured exercise. This is uh, everyday activity. For example, very fast walking. Remember my professor? The guy was on a mission everywhere that he went. I really uh, think that he'd walk right through someone if they got in his way. Other options include climbing stairs quickly, uh, carrying heavy shopping bags quickly, uh, walking uphill quickly, uh, and really just anything that could be leisurely and you choose to supercharge it with speed and purpose. Okay, that's still pretty general. The researchers did use some more exact methods. They're not perfect, but they're a good benchmark to assess if you're going in the right direction. So these numbers come from unpublished validation study, uh, also used by the researchers to create these cutoffs for vigorous intensity. Some of the metrics are based on VO2 max, not helpful to most, but I'll mention it anyway. The uh, physical activity should be above 64% of your VO2 max. As for more day-to-day -day measures, it's a combination of two metrics. One, you should be achieving equal to or above 77% of your maximum heart rate, as well as a perceived intensity of 15 or higher based on the Borg scale. No, not related to Star Trek. You can pause to see what that should look like right here. Achieving both the more objective heart rate metric and the more subjective Borg scale for about one minute gives you credit for one Vilpa bout which you can then cash in for one Zorbuck, which is then donated to achieve a Zalteron status. These names get ridiculous. I can't help myself. So overall, the point here is that you don't need to exercise to achieve significant reductions in mortality risk. If you simply keep doing the same things that you always do, but ramp up the intensity of daily tasks, like walking or climbing stairs, based on the metrics that we outlined, so 77% or greater of heart rate maximum and a 15 or greater on the Borg scale, for about one minute, you will achieve a vigorous intermittent lifestyle physical activity bout or VILPA bout. And the evidence suggests doing at least one to two of these per day is related to reduced risk, which is pretty amazing, isn't it? Bow. Vilpa Borg Zerbluta Linkrad Tang Zilkor Bin Finra? No, I'm not having a stroke. You just haven't played The Sims before, so you don't get it. But what I'm saying is, there's another video for you right here. So Vilpa your way to it. Click with intensity.